It's been a very interesting morning for me um, to hear English people, I think you mostly are English here, um, talk about Brexit. Uh, because from Ireland, it feels like we're on the Titanic heading toward the iceberg and uh, nobody is watching on the bridge. Um, it really, really feels like that for us and it sounds like it feels like that for you too. Um, and, and maybe we can turn it around as Molly has said and she, she made great speech but also I really liked her talk about this as a revolutionary moment. It is. It's a moment of crisis. I think it's really important not to just focus on the technical discussion. We had a very interesting uh, European Ideas Lab last um, couple of weekends ago in Dublin, and I went to two Brexit discussions. One was focused, w was convened by Patrick Harvey from Scotland, from Scottish Greens, and it was a very political, very interesting and discourse. And then the other was very technical between um, presentations from IEN in the Republic and the, and the Northern Ireland environment section, section in, in the North. Very technical, very important discussion on maintaining standards after Brexit. But I think for me, it's really, really useful to focus as Greens on the goal that we all have of an of a integrated social, economic and environmental um, to coming together in the, for purpose, the purpose of sustainability, because the crisis that we all face is that of climate change, and no country and no continent can deal with that alone. And we must remember that that is the context which we all came together as, as Greens uh, uh, for. I found my time in the European Parliament most wonderful because I was in a green family from people from all over Europe. And that was just so wonderful. Um, and other, other parliamentarians from other parties did have that experience too, I think. But it is particularly intense in the Greens because we are not basically technical or managerial. We do, we do have strong beliefs and we want to bring meaning back into our um, political discourse. And that, I think, is the way that we we'll reach hearts and minds, because if Brexit tells us anything, it's, and there are movements, as has been said, across Europe that have you know, been focused on the same kind of issues, um, is that a technical and managerial new <laughs> Um, neoliberal establishment is not is really not reaching people and is not putting in place the kind of pop, uh, uh, justice and sustainability and politics that they want. Um, but there is definitely also a problem with the European Union. Its its basic problem, I think, is that it's not intelligible to people. It's a, it's a vast, complex structure. It does a lot of good things, but people don't understand how it governs or the, whole, the system. And it could be actually very simple because the most visible part and I think the most active part really of the, the European institutions is European Council. People need to understand in England that it was David Cameron who agreed to the laws under which they're governed. Not somebody else, not somebody out in Germany or in Brussels. It was David Cameron, and before that, uh, whoever, you know, uh, Tony Blair. Tony Blair is of, of particular interest to me because he's now um, a, a pro-Remainer, and he's, uh, he, he lost many opportunities while he was in, in office to bring the European Union closer. Um, I've, I, he did one thing, while I was in Brussels, which I, I, I think was, was really re regrettable. He very much focused on his MEPs while he was in Brussels, what, who were in Brussels while he was in Downing Street. And for example, Carol Tung, was really, who was a um, um, Labour MEP, was really making inroads against Murdoch as she could on the committee that she was in in Brussels. He removed her off the list because she was directly threatening Murdoch and she disappeared. One of the most brilliant 
English MEPs. She was just moved off the list, off the list. I think it was in 1999. She was just gone. Look at her record. She was just fabulous. Um, the other thing that Blair failed to do was when it was possible for um, Chris Patton to be, head the European uh, Commission, he didn't push. You know, there are a lot of negotiations out there and Chris Patton would have been the person who could have really swung England behind um, the European Union because, he, again, you've had fabulous civil servants out there, but, you know, you do need somebody visible like Chris Patton. Uh, of course, you know, everyone pushes for their own. The French didn't want him particularly. The French never want the English in charge, with apologies to Viviane and Lucille, but, you know, that's just politics. You have to elbow your, your uh, you, know, you know, make room for your own people. Blair didn't do that. So, you know, he, he failed when, it was, when he was in a position and, you know, to, to, to come back now and say, oh, yeah, well, we, you know, I'm going to lead the anti-Brexit charge. Well, you know, it's pathetic. Uh, well, I won't say any more, but Tony Blair won't even go on to the Iraq war. But, but that was a moment. <laughs> <laughs> that was a moment when the people of Europe, all over Europe, were against that war. And, um, well, we didn't, uh, we didn't prevail. Um, what else can I say about the... Well, there's a lack of trust, of course. Um, going on to um, what we can do, I would really, you know, from the Irish perspective, we, have an, we are going to have an EU border on the island of Ireland. There are two islands in this archipelago, uh, and we've always been linked together. We share an awful lot of um, good things, and we've shared some bad experiences together, too. We need on the island of Ireland to keep at least there's a new idea now that Northern Ireland will stay within the customs union and perhaps even the single market. Well, while that would be good, it would be even better if the whole of the UK stayed within the customs union and the single market, whatever you, do, you think or not think about the single market and how it can be improved. Bringing the UK out of the single market is a total nightmare. Ireland trades one, one billion um, euro a week, a week with the UK. Uh, every small shop is provided with stuff uh, from, from the UK and we send you our beef and butter. And uh, without, we are rapidly looking around for other markets for the butter and the French are short of butter at the moment, but we will, we will never replace the UK as a market. So please do not do that, this to us. It is a nightmare. Please stay in the customs union. Uh, I don't know what you can do. I'm very heartened to hear the discussion about reversing Brexit, but we're not even thinking of that in Ireland, but we would like you to stay in the customs union. Uh, finally, I would just like to bring up the issue of the Euratom Treaty, which I haven't heard a peep about. Um, I would really like you to put it to your government that if it's going to pull out of the EU, why not the Euratom Treaty as well? You know, it's a bugbear of mine. Um, I would like to at least hear it mentioned. They're not ever going to pull out of Euratom, but please, let's have it part of the discussion. Um, that's really all I'm going to say to you. I'm going to start with uh, Vivian, uh, Vivian Gravi, who is going to talk to you about France, I think, Vivian. Okay, um, thank you very much. So I am a French academic living in the UK. That means most of my work on Brexit tends to be about Brexit and the environment here. So I was very happy uh, getting involved in this project. Yes, uh, so that I could... You have to speak near the yes. mic. Yes, okay. Yeah. Is this better like this? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That I could finally uh, look at what France was thinking on this topic. And so we had our um, event in June. And there, for me, it completely struck me that when you live in the UK or in Ireland, you don't realise that the rest of the continent doesn't speak about Brexit. The rest has moved on. Brussels perhaps hasn't. But it's just Brexit is just not that high on the agenda. And when we talk, when we start talking about Europe, even Europe is not very high on the agenda, but Brexit is not the highest European topic. It's not just not very, it's not, it's not considered important. It's because it's something in the past. The vote was done. So I think when we are talking about potentially reversing Brexit here, we need to think that for the rest of the 27, 
that ship has sailed, potentially. So there's also lots of work to be done to make sure that if the UK manages to reverse Brexit, it doesn't end up with a closed door on the other side of the channel. But so our, our discussion, I think, in, in France was re really interesting because it showed that the, que the big problems we've had around the referendum here in terms of the lack of understanding of the EU is definitely citizens across Europe don't necessarily understand the EU <coughs> better than citizens in the UK. This is a problem across all of Europe. But what citizens did understand, and that works well with what our chair was saying, is that you know, Europe as nations potentially sometime working together sometime working against each other. So the whole idea that in France we should be unhappy that the UK was leaving was something that, you know, lots of people were quite, actually quite happy that the UK was leaving. Because they're thinking we could have a social Europe. We can do all of these things that the UK have stopped us from doing. And I think that's why going into it to talk about the environment was a very helpful way of talking about it. Because on the environment, the UK has been a leader in lots of areas that most French citizens do not know about, uh, and also has been a laggard in lots of areas. So the UK has been a leader on climate change, has been a leader on greening agricultural policy, but has been a laggard into talking about the environment as red tape, uh, bringing that language, that's a UK language brought into Brussels, um, has been a Strongly, strongly opposing any kind of carbon tax because it doesn't want any tax levied at EU level, opposed soil directives, lots of di different things. So depending on where you sit on these issues, having the UK out of the equation might help or might actually be a problem. I think the problem with this, looking at this as just plus or minus, is that I think we, it will be very easy to replace the UK as a laggard. Lots of other states were hiding behind the UK mm -hmm. when the UK was a laggard. <coughs> I don't think we're going to have as many states just <coughs> becoming new champions on climate change and on greening agricultural policy. So that's going to be a key problem. I think one of the arguments that I hope resonated with the audience that day in Paris was that the UK is not just a UK government. That in Brussels, the influence of the UK is also really felt through NGOs, through civil service, through many actors that have potentially been much more constructive yeah. in terms of European integration than the top of the UK government. And that the UK leaving means also all of these people leaving. All of the UK NGOs that have been critical at Brussels are going to have to refocus on what's happening in London because there's so much at stake. That also creates an opportunity for the French, for the German NGOs, for any kind of other NGOs in Europe that want to step up and shape the agenda. But whether they have the money, whether they have the will and the capacity to do so, I think it's really much in, up in the air. And this matters for France because France really is now trying, as a source of national pride as well, to really deliver on the Paris Agreement. You know, it was signed in Paris, so it's up to France to make sure it's delivered. <laughs> so, and it's actually it's very... <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's, how, that's how it's presented in the French media. Um, so I think here the fact that the UK, I mean the questions around whether the UK will s s remain in the ETS, whether Poland will actually play a much uh, stronger role in climate policy and potentially less positive sure. than the UK. Um, you know, these are very, very key problems for France. But I think ge generally, geography matters. That if you have either the UK or the EU moving toward deregulation, dismantling of the environment, it's going to make it very, very hard for the other side to resist a call from industry saying that, well, you know, we've got unfair competition on the other side. If France and other countries that are not very keen on greening agricultural policy manage to roll back la the last reform of the cap, well then it's going to be much harder for UK farmers to get, like, for, it's going to be much harder for the UK to get a greener agricultural policy, because farmers will argue there's unfair competition. If you have, and it can be the other way around of course, uh, despite what Michael Gove is saying currently, we could have dismantling of environmental policy in the UK, especially if lots of amendments are not passed on the withdrawal bill, and then that puts a lot of pressure on Europe. Now, I think it's important to also be mildly hopeful because on both sides, we've got Macron right now and Gove, who both said very positive things about reimagining their country and reimagining the continent in a more environmentally uh, friendly way. 
Sina, Emmanuel Macron in his speech in, uh, in the Sorbonne in September, said that he deeply, deeply believes that Europe must be a pioneer of an effective and equitable ecological transition. And for this to happen, we need to transform our transport, our housing, our industry. And he's calling for a, floor, a carbon floor price, a UK idea, by the way, uh, interconnections, regional transition contract, border carbon tax, yeah, lots of incredible things. But it's an incredibly long speech, right? So the ecological transition bit is still very small within that. Thing. But it is quite surprising for a president that is not necessarily known for his green credential, that he's pushing that. And of course, we've heard here in the UK that we have this incredible and frozen moment uh, and in which we'll be able to deliver an incredibly green Brexit. Um, and that the UK will be even more ambitious and freed from uh, the anti-science shackle of the European Commission that did some very bad things around the common fisheries policy. These kind of things that we hear repeatedly from Michael Gove. So we can perhaps be hopeful. At least they're saying it's going to get greener. But we need to be careful too. I think in the 1990s, in 2000, Europe was trying to rebrand itself around green, around you know, an environmental Europe, a green Europe. And since then, it's kind of walked back on lots of these commitments. Not necessarily by removing the law, but by perhaps enforcing them a bit less. And by not ranking up uh, the pressure and when we know much more now about biodiversity loss, about climate change, we're not doing much more. So I think we need to be very careful that the ecological transition, just like the European integration, is not necessarily a one-way process. And we need to be very careful that, at least on the greening side, that we're not missing out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vivian. Um, I'd now like to ask Eva Sufin Jakmar from the Polish Foundation to speak to us. So I would like to uh, present to you uh, our event uh, in Poland and uh, uh, first maybe two words about Strefa Zieleni, our Green Foundation, our Green Party. So uh, Polish Green Party is uh, exists for 14 years already, but we are a very small party in very hard context. And, um, and Strefa Zieleni is the foundation connected to the party. So um, our principal activity uh, now is to organize since three years uh, our Green Summer Academy. And it's the place the, where we uh, make people meet together, not only the activists, but also all kinds of organizations, activists, movements, and so on. So just to uh, uh, act on the activism and the uh, awareness of people. So this, is, this was our debate. Uh, Europe after Brexit, will the green transition still be possible? Uh, with Philip Lambert's in video, uh, where I'm Dr. Ray Cunningham, uh, from a greenhouse uh, think tank, Lucille Schmidt, who is here, Marek Kosakowski, the co-chair of our Green Party, Jakub Gogolewski from the Foundation uh, uh, Development, yes, uh, Open Mining, no, and the moderation of Bartłomiej Kozek from Green European Journal. Uh, you see where we were, and uh, it was Green Summer Academy Hope and Cope uh, in Puszczykowo near Poznań. Um, and this is the, all the team. So the advantage to make it during the Green Summer Academy is that you have all those people so uh, speaking about and uh, discussing about Brexit and Europe after Brexit. And this is to make you dream a little bit to show you that we were not in the city, we were outside the city, and it was just uh, 550 meters from the place where we were. We were. So uh, Philip Lambert started, he couldn't come, he was in video. Uh, so uh, his principal messages uh, were that uh, Brexit was uh, really a surprise to him. However, as he said, no one in the United Kingdom ever made a positive case for the European Union. Even the Remainers, uh, even the pro-EU people in UK were always motivated by sort of logic that EU is a necessary evil that can bring some advantages but not a value in itself. Uh, concerning the green transition, he defended the thesis that only a united Europe could find a way for Europeans to respond to the great challenges facing the world in the age of globalization. 
and uh, um, uh, 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 only common coordinated actions by all the member states can lead the union through the necessary transition above all the energy transition uh, needed to stop climate change and to achieve the climate goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the other message uh, of Philip was that many European citizens, including the green activists and voters, criticize the neoliberal uh, policy of the European Union. However, he defended the thesis that uh, uh, as Democrats we have to accept the fact that in Europe for the moment most people support uh, the neoliberal proposals. So because there is no political majority for progressive and green solutions, uh, that's why Greens must redouble their efforts to persuade citizens of their countries and to create the majority that will uh, enable us to grow in a sust sustainable way. Um, uh, Ray Cunningham uh, made a lecture uh, for the Polish public to uh, speak a little bit uh, why Brexit, to sh he showed us some history. Uh, some deeper explanations and some immediate uh, explanatory factors. And, um, and after in the debate, uh, we, uh, we, he was asked, uh, what about Brexit? Uh, will it really be a Brexit? And uh, what kind of Brexit? So uh, he confirmed that uh, in his opinion, there will be Brexit because it's a question of democracy. So I would be curious to know if uh, uh, five months later it's still his opinion. Um, and um, uh, 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 he agrees with Philip Lambert that effective protection of the environment in the Euro European Union uh, seems impossible <coughs> uh, uh, for only one country. Therefore, uh, Brexit could be a big blow to the pro-ecological transformation of the Union, but also of Britain itself. He believes that Brexit will take place, uh, as I said, uh, but possibility that Brexit will not happen is after the uh, election slightly stronger than it was before, but still it's not more than 10%. Is it still 10% or is it more now? Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, he said that uh, he thought that probably Britain could end up in a position somewhere between Norway and Switzerland, which is a horrible sel self damaging compromise, but this would be something that UK could live with as it satisfies its own sense of exception. So that's something that we could uh, discuss now. Uh, concerning the green transition, um, what will happen in the United Kingdom will depend on who will have the power and who will control the economy. In theory, it, uh, it is possible that despite Brexit, a progressive green transition will occur. However, if conservative forces will keep control and they have a great ability to keep power, it's not to be expected any other way than today's neoliberal economy, because continuity, tradition and stability are important for them, not progressive green reform. Uh, so the next speaker was Lucy Schwimit, who is uh, here. And um, uh, she referred to the union's energy policy and noted that the pro uh, ecological transformation encounters a strong resistance of lobbyists, um, exerting strong pressure on the European Commission. Uh, the fact that the energy policy is not a competence of the community but uh, of each member state alone does not help, uh, for the member states have very different energy models. When the first climate and energy package came out in 2008, the EU was stronger than it is today. And um, also we know as Greens that uh, 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 ecological transfer, transformation transition is necessary, it does not mean that we will win, uh, said Lucille Schmidt, because the resistance is very strong. The conservative forces are strong in France and in other EU countries, and we confirm it that it's extremely strong in Poland too. She also noted that EU rules and policies are inconsistent. The development uh, of new um, uh, uh, renewable technologies 
technology is, is costly and requires major public investment, while at the same time member states are not allowed to exceed 3% of public debt. So this is one of uh, examples of, of all the inconsistency of uh, different uh, European policies. We observe it on, in, on many topics. Um, uh, regarded Brexit, uh, she emphasizes the general acceptance for Brexit in France. Uh, and uh, uh, I will not repeat what she told us uh, this morning. Uh, mm, uh, uh, it's good that Macron will strongly support the European uh, Union policy because today it's uh, in the European Parliament that the French Greens have the strongest influence. Uh, what um, we liked in uh, the proposal as, as Polish uh, uh, ecologists, we liked the uh, proposal to uh, um, use uh, uh, Nicolas Hulot, the new Minister of the uh, Ecological uh, and Solidar Transition, as uh, someone who could support also not only French movements and uh, uh, French ecologists, but also uh, somewhere else in Europe as uh, in Poland, because we have no representation neither in European Parliament nor in our Parliament. Um, uh, the next speaker was uh, inter a very interesting, uh, interesting person, uh, Jakub uh, Gogoleski, who is now an uh, activist of the new foundation fighting against lignite open mining, um, uh, open pit mining. And, but before, he was working for years for uh, Bankwatch Network. So he knows uh, extremely well all those questions of financing. What I liked in his, what I stressed in his, what he said, it's the question of generations. It's true that our uh, leaders uh, in the United Kingdom, but also in Poland, in many countries, are people from the generation that did not live in, the, their, in their youth uh, in the European Union. And the new, it's time for a new generation of politicians that knew already the European Union as, a, as the, uh, the environment. Uh, the co-chair of Polish Green Party, Marek uh, Kosakowski, uh, uh, they discussed and this question of uh, two, uh, uh, two speeds uh, Europe was a very important topic of this debate. It's a hard topic for Polish uh, public. It's a hard topic for the Polish Green Party <coughs> because it's very unpopular in Poland. So, so that's something that uh, we will continue to discuss. From what point of view, from some points of view, it would be really something that we could support to have a group of countries that would push harder than others into sustainable uh, transition. But on the other hand, for the Polish public, for the Polish citizens who are very strongly pro-European, but they don't want to be uh, left uh, behind, uh, it's a very, uh, very sensitive question. Uh, for in the voices on the debate, I would like to uh, uh, just uh, show one voice of Isabella Zygmunt, who is now activist of Bankwatch Network, who stressed the new sixth scenario for European Union as something in opposition uh, to the five scenarios of the European Commission. And that is something that, as a Green family, we couldn't really support. It's very pro-ecological, pro-social, and uh, first of all, pro-citizens' uh, 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 proposal. So, uh, just a few conclusions for to, to finish. Uh, it can be expected that after the Brexit, the transition to sustainable development will be some more difficult in isolated uh, Britain than in the European Union. But the conditions negotiated for the Brexit will be decisive. decisive. In EU or, with or without UK, the green transition will not be easy to achieve, as the corporations are stronger every year and the neoliberal system largely dominates. Uh, Two-speed Europe could be an option, but the phase out of fossil fuels and energy transition into energy efficiency and 100% renewables must be a general plan for energy union. And the real challenge for Greens is not to give up on Europe and European integration in spite of Brexit and especially after Brexit. 
Uh, and the last thing that I'm really speaking very uh, loudly about is the uh, Paris Agreement and uh, climate change. Um, we were, uh, were already speaking about this. We are just in, uh, in uh, COP23 and there will be COP24 in Paris, in, in Poland, <coughs> in the heart of uh, mining, uh, mining region, and there will be a world summit of coal at the same time in Katowice in parallel. So this is a really important moment for Greens. We must be very present, and we are we are small green uh, team there uh, to support it. But we will do everything to mobilize all kind of ecological organizations and movement to make uh, really a big presence, green presence. Uh, in Katowice. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to call on Michael Carlson, uh, President of the European Environmental Bureau, to talk to us. Thank you very much, and thank you for, for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Let me just uh, correct the program a bit. Uh, one year ago, when I was elected uh, as President for the EEB, for my 12th year, I, I said I will not run again for election. So in Edinburgh, four days ago, that was granted. So I, I'm not any longer the president <laughs> of the EEB. Uh, surprisingly, though, they made me into honorary member. So in a way, I, I think I, I, I need to say a few words for on behalf of the environmental movement. But um, what I do, where I spend most of my time is um, at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, where I uh, do research on environmental policy, environmental governance, risk governance, science policy interactions. Um, I've been nerdly occupied by the precautionary principle for many years, for instance. Um, well, this is extremely complex. It, it's, it, it, Brexit is extremely complex, and I, I think we can only see the tip of the iceberg, in a way, uh, in terms of what might happen in, in the future. I think we have not even started to see the debate that can develop in different other member countries, uh, whether or not Eurosceptics uh, feel that they get uh, support or wind uh, for, for, for their ideas. But also very basic ideas in Sweden, for instance, we have this debate about uh, the budget. Why should Sweden continue to pay more when UK is not in the future and if they get a free trade agreement? So the Eurosceptics can find different ways of using this to get leverage to push for their very uh, strange positions in a way. Um, so this also has, for, for me, when I'm looking at it, it's, it's a Kafka-like situation. And I, I think this special relationship between across the Atlantic between the US, on the one hand, with Trump and Brexit here is a very special type of special relationship these days. So, <laughs> um, but I'm happy to come back on, on the Swedish situation. Just want to make some remarks um, on how I have seen UK operating the last 20 years, which is the period more or less where, when, in which I have followed EU environmental politics. Um, and of course, very generally, but I, I agree on what was said previously in the panel that UK has been, let's call it comparatively progressive um, on, on climate change issues, uh, now and then also on, on energy, uh, from a certain point of view also on the common agriculture policy. Um, so th there are such examples and on climate it has been really instrumental over the years uh, to have UK pushing in, in for, for, for stricter or more ambitious uh, policies and, and, and laws, even though the EU is not in any way near to embark on a, on a route that leads to fulfillment of uh, the agreements of the target, the, uh, reaching the targets in the climate treaty from Paris. Uh, the other side of the coin, which is larger, um, this is not a good metaphor, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I realized, sorry. <laughs> UK has definitely been very problematic in terms of deregulation and what's called red tape. And, and that's so interesting. Whenever I enter a hotel in the UK, I, I, I start to think about these fire escape yeah. routes and doors and things. That, that Is this the country where they had, hate red tape and regulations? <laughs> um, 
But REACH is a clear example. I, I've written quite a lot as scientists on, on the REACH regulation, and um, UK was not helpful. Uh, for instance, when, when um, a, a previous prime minister helped with, together with France and, and Germany to move the whole issue from the Environment Council to the Competitiveness Council, it's just one example. Um, and um, I hear it quite often. I was previously uh, linked to the Centre for Risk Management at King's here in London, so I, I attended a number of seminars, and quite often there was a person from the Tories saying, Ooh! something like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the conclusion was that uh, environmental policy is very harmful in terms of employment, uh, economics, competitiveness and growth for those who want growth and things like that. And One of these spokespersons mentioned Denmark, even small Denmark is sort of running ahead of UK in terms of economic uh, achievements and I asked, well, does it depend on the environmental policy then? <laughs> Um, and of course, it's the other way around. There is no theoretical or empirical support at all that uh, environmental policy uh, hampers economic development uh, per se. It's rather the other way around. We know that today, but, but still. So this red tape, getting rid of that and, and um, uh, the regulation. U UK has been very problematic on that over the years. So we might get rid of that um, now. Uh, in the negotiations, what do we say then from the environmental movement? Well, the Green 10 is a collaboration between EB, Greenpeace, WWF, uh, well, 10 as you hear, uh, green organizations in Brussels. We say that, I, I would say, a potential EU-UK deal must not in any way weaken or undermine EU environmental policy or law. That's not negotiable. And furthermore, that EU should make any preferential access to the EU market after a potential Brexit conditional on the UK fully agreeing to the entire uh, EU environmental key and environmental law. Moreover, and this links to trade issues as well, it's important that any kind of agreement in the future will not prevent development of EU uh, environmental policy or, or stall that or delay that in any way. And there are numerous other issues. So, so this means that to some extent I think also that the EU should say that, well, remaining in the emission trading scheme, remaining in the so-called effort, you know, it was f first burden, burden sharing, now it's effort sharing. In the future when we realized all the core benefits, this will be benefit sharing regulation on climate change, but we're not there yet. So, um, I mean, it's definitely so that UK must uh, comply with all these um, uh, policies. Um, I raised the question before if you would get leverage for a green UK during this debate. Well, of course, it's 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 possible. It's possible to trans tra transitions, transformations, and I'm not the one to judge on on domestic politics. But what I've seen in in the Council and the European Parliament for two decades, it, it, well, I would not be very surprised if, um, now if considering the forces that were pushing for Brexit, if, if you would come out worse in terms of environment if, if you were to leave uh, the, the European Union. Um, we don't see much of UK sort of doing the green transformation in, in Europe, and those advocating Brexit are probably those that are less keen on doing so. Um, and, and excuse me for saying, but the, the Greens and your causes are, as in other countries, not that huge in, in, in British politics either. So, not yet. Uh, not yet. So maybe, maybe a green, green Brexit is a bit of wishful thinking. Is the EU greening then? Well, no, I don't see that. Um, uh, Juncker, who is just mirroring what member states are, are saying, uh, is not embarking on the green route. On the contrary, he, is, he has downplayed, he has delayed, he has dismantled environmental policy with climate politics as one, uh, one um, exception, uh, even though, as I said, EU is far from the right track on climate as well. Fortunately, though, uh, Juncker has repeatedly failed in his uh, most severe attacks on environmental policy. He has not been so successful on, on dismantling completely on air, or the circular economy, or um, open up nature legislation. He, he has been opposed by the civil society, by businesses, and by member states. So, and he has not understood how to build trust. And the fact that the 2016 Eurobarometer shows that 77% of respondents say that environment is one of the key aspects with the European Union. So it's really 
Juncker has been playing in the hands of those wanting to see uh, Brexit. Uh, well, having si said this, of course, we need to continue to build the narrative and show um, how a green transformation can happen on member state level, on EU level, globally, etc. That, that's really important. But I just want to close now by, by saying that I do not see in any way that a Brexit would help a green transformation. Not at all. That's completely impossible for me to, to understand whether we talk about Sweden, UK, EU, or globally. I, I just don't see that. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'd now like to ask uh, Terry Reinschke mm -hmm. Very from good. Germany to speak to us. I um, don't know what you're going to say, but please go ahead. <laughs> Thanks a lot, and thanks already for the very interesting discussion we had in the morning. Um, and I wanted to share with you a small anecdote before I start, because the last time I was in London on Amistice Day with the people and the poppy bins, pins, sorry, um, it was when I was 16 years old in 2003. So I'm actually one of the youngest MEPs in the European Parliament. So we do have a, a lot of young people in the Green Movement as well. Um, and I was, uh, I was very, I don't know interested in why people were wearing these poppy pins and um, I was very excited about being in London because I just uh, went to school in uh, close to Margate, uh, close to Canterbury for half a year and when I was getting out of the train this morning I kind of went back to that moment and how excited I was back then to be in London and how Britain for me was really this dream place that I always wanted to be and that I was imagining to live. And then I was getting out of the train this morning and then I thought, oh, how much has this changed in the last years? I mean, I still love Britain, but you know, the, the whole context has just really changed and it made me very sad in a way. And I'm so happy that now we have the possibility um, to discuss this, but also to look at possible good endings that this whole story can still take and then maybe in I don't know 15 years I'm back at St Pancras and I think about how I will you know soon live in Britain after all or something like this and um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective on how Brexit is being debated in Germany not necessarily only on ecological issue but a little bit a broader picture how the Brexit in Brexit negotiations are seen and I would second Vivian that uh, the general mood in Germany is that the interest is going down there is less and less political debate about Brexit um, and this is of course also close to the fact that uh, um, because of the fact that actually amongst the political the relevant political parties there is not so much disagreement on how we should act in Brexit there is a lot of unity so if you go along the political spectrum nobody completely disagrees with the line that the government is taking right now uh, and this is why there is not so much a political debate um, I still think a lot of people are wondering what is actually happening because I have the feeling that compared to France the German population at least the mainstream population has always kind of looked up to Britain and even though we don't really understand your electoral system and you know your political system sometimes I think there was always a very big part of the society that kind of thought well democracy in the UK somehow works you know it's like a solid country and now in the last year I must say that I think this belief has really been shaken in Germany and many people are thinking kind of uh, what is actually going on there um, what will come out of this um, and there is a kind of disbelief amongst people and I sometimes compare it to you know how you have this childhood friend that you always kind of look up to or you have even secretly been in love with and then when you grow up you realize that you know they're becoming kind of weird and they start acting in a very <laughs> unexpected way and you don't really know how to act so you are in kind of panic about what is this all about and I think this is what a lot of German people feel at the moment about what is happening in Britain so um, I hope that we can still turn this around indeed and find out what has been going wrong and just to make one last point about the general mood I was now saying most of the parties so you of course have a rise now of the AFD this uh, extreme right-wing party that has entered the German Parliament and they are very Eurosceptical but still them 
they are not very explicitly saying that Brexit is a good thing and that Germany should, should follow suit. So even they are scared of explicitly saying that, the Euro that, that Germany should leave the European Union. So I think this kind of shows to you how, how clear um, a pro kind of pro-European stance is, uh, at least amongst the political class in Germany. But I think also if you look at the polls, um, the support of the European Union as in many other European countries, has actually gone up since the Brexit vote rather than gone down. So um, I wanted to talk about five specific points um, when it comes to Brexit and a little bit give you what the discussion is in Germany right now. And I think the first one, Germans love talking about money. So money is definitely a, a very big part of the debate. Um, and I think that there is a little bit this it's an impression that you know the Brits are a very reliable people, and now that they want to leave the European Union, they do not want to pay their bills. And this is something that creates a lot of, um, well, feeling uneasy, and I think a, a lot of um, unhappiness amongst uh, the German population. And it's it's kind of also raising a more tense discussion about um, the, the question of what Brexit will actually look look like. And it also, of course, raises the question, and uh, Michael has also mentioned it, what will be the role of Germany after Brexit? And we as Greens, as you know, are currently in uh, talks about joining a possible coalition. Um, and one of the things that we have put into these uh, coalition talks was that we want to substitute the money that is going to be lost uh, if Brexit happens um, from the British con uh, contribution um, fr from the German budget. And we really want to make this a strong point in the coalition talks. Um, so that the EU budget doesn't go down, because this is, of course, a very big concern. It's not so much about the people on the federal level, but very much for the people on the local level, because if you look at where the money from the regional funds are actually going, uh, it's very often the people on the local level that are massively profiting from that. They are afraid. So um, there is... a. a well, there is on the one side a very tense debate about what Britain is going to pay, kind of, and on the other side the question of how the German contribution will look like after Brexit. Um, I think in terms of citizens, we had a discussion about migration before and what is, um, well, how this has been a part of, um, uh, of the Brexit referendum and the campaign beforehand. And I actually believe that in Germany, it strengthens the discourse around what kind of advantages there actually are from having freedom of movement in the European Union. Whereas at the same time, and I was trying to voice that before, there is a certain stream, so especially the right wing also going into the conservative um, um, kind of electorate, that are very closely looking at to what kind of possibilities are given to Britain now, and then possibly jump on you know these these kind of exceptions and ask the same for for, for Germany. So I think that there is a generally positive discourse, but at the same time, there are certain parts of the political spectrum that are trying to basically undermine freedom of movement altogether by what is coming out of the Brexit discussion. The third point, um, and I believe that we are also going to have uh, additional comments on that, um, the question of uh, the border between um, Ireland and Northern Ireland um, is something that is very emotionally discussed. So basically every event that I have, and I do not only discuss this among screens, but in general, the, the topic that most questions are being asked about and also where there is most unclarity on how to actually solve this issue is the question of the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. And one of the questions that I'm very often being asked, and maybe some of you can answer this to me, well, you know, well, you know the, the Brits wanted to take back control and you know, being able to control your borders was one of the biggest discussions in this whole campaign. And now they don't want the European Union to be able to control their borders. So how, how does this actually make sense at all? Um, I, for me, I must say that this is, of course, also a very emotional topic because f for, I think, most con continental Europeans, the story of the European Union is a story of peace. And now the discussion about the border between Northern Ireland uh, and Ireland, um, is especially when it comes to the questions of the peace process, of course, a very, very sensitive one. The fourth point, this hasn't been mentioned so much yet, but I think in the German debate it's also playing a very important role, is the question of the ECJ, the European Court of Justice. And quite oppositely to the debates that have been going on in Britain, 
I think in Germany there is actually a lot of trust and positive feelings towards the ECJ. There is this kind of understanding that, um, you know, you live in this globalized world, there's globalization. What are actually our tools to tame these developments that are happening in a globalized world? And the ECJ has always been seen as one of the institutions that has a certain kind of authority over enforcing agreements and rules that you know, several nations have been decided upon, have decided upon. And there is a, a, a fear that now with undermining the rulings of the ECJ, the role of the ECJ altogether, that there will, um, that there, there will be a, a kind of limbus created. So some people were actually referring back to the Soviet Union, you know. In the Soviet Union you had laws for everything. But there was no institution that could actually challenge a government enough to actually enforce these rules. So citizens in the Soviet Union had all rights that you can imagine, but there would be no court that would actually say to the government, look, these are rights and you need to, um, to guarantee people to have these rights. And this is um, why I think that this question of the ECJ is actually a really, really a crucial one, also when it comes to citizens' rights and so on, what will be the role of the, of the ECJ after all. And now I'm coming to my last point, I think I'm running out of time, okay. and that is, um, that first of all, and I, I recently had a discussion with a um, senior um, civil servant from the foreign ministry, I really think that there is no sense of retaliation amongst the German government, the German population. I think very little people want to punish anybody in Britain for anything that has happened. But I still think that there is a lot of insecurity and a lot of disappointment actually about what has been happening and what especially the British government is doing right now. And I think many people are lost and they don't really know um, how to deal with this situation. And that's why I wanted to a little bit, when we talk about the future, go into what had also a couple of speakers have said before, that um, I think that, of course, the question about what you know, the Brits or the British discussion and Brexit are going to be is the one side. But I also think that we will have to look at what do we actually make of it in a more European discourse and what do we actually make of it in terms of how can we reform the European Union. And I think there is a big wish to move this forward but at the same time, as long as there is no clarity on Brexit and, you know, this kind of feeling of insecurity, it's very difficult for anybody to, you know, ask for treaty changes in the European Union if we don't really know what, what kind of relationship will we actually have to the United Kingdom. Uh, and that's why I think we are a little bit in a, in a blocking situation right now. And if you ask me, um, and this is, of course, you know, a German citizen speaking to a room that is mainly, I think, uh, populated by, by British people, I still hope that we can turn this around. And I still hope that Brexit is not going to happen and I'm not going to give up this hope until the day that it's actually happening. And then from day one after Brexit, I will fight for you to come back. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. I think you speak definitely for the young Greens all over <laughs> Europe there. I'd now like to ask um, John Barry, who is Professor of Green Political Economy, economy, I think, yes, um, in the Queen's University in Belfast. Please go Great. ahead. Uh, th thank you, Nola. Uh, I clearly had uh, too much coffee and too little time on the train from Cambridge this morning, so it, a bit like Winston Churchill, who's over here. I've written you a long speech because I haven't had time to write a short one. <laughs> and it has three different titles. One is Impacts of Brexit in and on Northern Ireland. Or A Tale of Being Duped, Brexit and Expensive Supply for Little Confidence. And the last one, Brexistentialist Crisis, Rebordering John Bull's Other Island. And I'm actually going to talk mostly about Northern Ireland rather than the Republic and mostly about the preconditions for green transformations as opposed to those transformations directly, namely peace, political stability, and democracy as non-violent disagreement. So I'll shape my comments in terms of peace and non-violence, which, as we all know well, is one of the founding four principles of the green movement. Uh, some context to my talk. Northern Ireland voted to remain by 56%. All the main parties, with the exception of the Democratic Unionist Party, they're the dupes, uh, were part of the Remain campaign. 
It also turns out that this party channeled Brexit funding to England in this Northern Ireland-based party, taking funds from this odd constitutional reform unit to pay for Brexit campaign material in England. And also, the largest trade union in Northern Ireland, the public sector union known as the Northern Ireland Public Sector Alliance, voted for Lexit. So in Northern Ireland, we had probably the clearest expression of this left-wing argument for leaving Europe. And here's the rub. Northern Ireland has benefited considerably for EU structural and peace funds to the tune of 2.4 billion euros between 2007 and 2013, with a similar amount promised between 2014 and 2020. And in the wake of the vote last year, Brexit caused me not only to have a Brexitentialist crisis, but almost have to go to the doctor because of repetitive strain injury from filling in forms for Irish passports. <laughs> After, I think as Norman Baker said, people were Googling what is the EU, I think the Irish Passport Office crashed in terms of the wake of the Brexit vote. But in the wake of June 2016, and we've had two elections in Northern Ireland since then, as an aside, we don't do politics in Northern Ireland, we do elections. Uh, we don't elect legislators but negotiators, uh, and we also tend to march into the future looking backwards. But since that vote, and subsequent, I have never felt such a growing political polarisation in Northern Ireland. And it is noteworthy here that while Northern Ireland voted to remain, the Leave vote was heaviest in unionist areas and greatest levels of support to remain in nationalist areas. So the issue around Brexit has become sectarianised. Not, however, in the area where I live and work as a councillor in the evenings and at weekends in North Down. It's a largely unionist area, but it was the only area to vote remain. We could call that the Barry effect. <laughs> <laughs> We've not had a functioning government here in Northern Ireland since January when Sinn Féin, the largest nationalist party, resigned under Martin McGuinness, the then Deputy First Minister. And there's a Brexit element to the crisis. We've had two elections, a local assembly one in March, which saw two noticeable results, both of which were fl inflamed or fanned by Brexit. The first is that Sinn Féin did exceptionally well, coming within one seat behind the DUP, which had been the largest party in Northern Ireland for almost a decade. The second is that the assembly as a whole, unionists lost their overall majority. Round two, ding ding, June. We have the Westminster election, which saw a comeback for the DUP, which took 10 seats and enabled them, of course, to have their supply and confidence arrangement with uh, um, the, the Conservative Party, but also for Sinn Féin, who took seven seats, but they're an abstentionist party and don't go to Westminster. However, as I say, this disastrous result for the Conservatives meant they were forced to enter into this confidence and supply arrangement with the DUP. And as a some degree of schadenfreude and delight that many of us in Northern Ireland watched the apoplexy and curiosity and horror as the English public suddenly figured out what the DUP were. Welcome to our world. <laughs> and of course, there's much discussion now that we have nobody representing Northern Ireland because we haven't had a government since January, but I think we do. It's the DUP whispering softly into Derek Davis, David Davis's ears. However, it's not only the DUP who's using Brexit. Sinn Féin, for its part, have decided that Brexit has reopened the border issue. It's a political opportunity for their goal of reuniting Ireland. Immediately after the June 2016 result, they call for a border poll, which is part of the 1998 agreement and at the discretion of the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, uh, who refused. But they have coordinated a campaign along the border counties in Ireland against a hard Brexit. And it also perhaps coincides with their political calculation that it is not in their interest currently to co-govern Northern Ireland with the DUP and to stay out deliberately while Brexit runs its messy course. But there are impacts in the Republic. In the Republic of Ireland, Sinn Féin, along with other parties, notably Fianna Fáil, uh, one of the previously largest parties in, in the Republic, they've been promoting Brexit as an opportunity to reunite Ireland. For example, an Irish parliamentary joint committee on the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, led by members of these two parties, Sinn Féin and Fianna Fáil, produced a report in July this year entitled Uniting Ireland and its People in Peace and Prosperity. And the report begins from this premise, and I quote, Brexit means that the best future for the citizens of Northern Ireland could well be within remaining in the EU in a reunified Ireland. This option must be explored and examined. 
The challenge now is to lay out how to achieve the constitutional obligation of a united Ireland, end quote. And the example they use quite a bit is the example of East Germany, in terms of the reunification of Germany and East Germany automatically becoming a member of the European Union. The issue here, I think, what really gives the political opportunism behind this is that a leading Sinn Féin MEP, next time you see Matt McCarthy, ask him this, he has said, for our part, Sinn Féin understand that we cannot win a United Ireland campaign without the support of other pro-unity parties. And I actually think this joint Irish government report, sorry, a joint parliamentary report, is the first attempt by <coughs> Sinn Féin and Fianna Fáil to lead a pro-unity coalition across the island. This report had no input at all from unionists and is only going to further destabilise and entrench their position. And here's the reality is that we have a hard Brexiteers buoyed up by the DUP. And although the EU has repeatedly and very publicly expressed its willingness to be flexible in the case of Northern Ireland and the border, it has called for, I quote, imaginative and creative solutions to the border to minimise the extremely negative economic and indeed even more serious political impacts of a hard border. It has suggested Northern Ireland remaining part of customs union that Nuala has already mentioned and shifting the border perhaps to the Irish Sea. But all of this has been rebuffed, of course, by unionists who don't want to see any border within the UK. And I think this is Derek David Davis speaking, but it's the DUP writing the script. This is him yesterday. Derek Davis. David Davis. Must get his name, Davis. <laughs> DD, dummy. <coughs> we recognise the need for specific solutions to the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland. That's pretty good. But let me be clear. This cannot amount to creating a new border inside our United Kingdom. That's pure DUP. So imaginative and creative solutions do not apply within the UK, but only between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. However, there are some positives, and I was heartened to see, particularly in terms of Molly and, and Rupert and others, talking about what are the opportunities here. But even here in Northern Ireland, there are some positive opportunities. On the one hand, it's forced a re-examination of the 1998 peace agreement and a need to restate the constitutional fundamental, fundamentals of a commitment to peace and to revisit neglected issues. For example, Brexit forces the agreement up the political agenda. It offers an opportunity to reform the agreement and also to complete some of its unfinished work. One area here is on the protection of human rights. There is still no Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland and there's no Charter of Rights for the island of Ireland, both of which were promised in the 1998 agreement. Another is in using the political stalemate in Northern Ireland to argue for more citizen involvement, for Northern Ireland to follow or adapt citizen-based initiatives such as the Constitutional Convention in the Republic of Ireland or post-crash Iceland. This has been promoted and proposed vigorously by the Green Party in Northern Ireland. Whether this, in terms of really taking back control and giving it to citizens, will gain public support the longer we're out and the longer these negotiations go on remains to be seen. But it does allow, as Molly pointed out, that Greens and others can co-opt this idea of take back control and use this to mean bringing citizens into decision making. But while I've outlined a possible silver lining to conclude in the Northern Ireland Brexit has shook an already fragile and fractious power sharing arrangement. And while we cannot blame the current impasse on Brexit, like climate change and hurricanes, Brexit has certainly exacerbated and made the situation immeasurably worse, perhaps for years to come. Hence, without this political precondition, that is a working power sharing arrangement for Northern Ireland, while not ruling out the possibilities of green transformations in energy, agriculture, transport, and so on, it does make it immeasurably harder. And this in Northern Ireland, which is the only part of these islands without an independent environmental protection agency, where without EU environmental directives, our already degraded landscape, including having Europe's largest illegal dump, will be in a much worse situation. So, to ask the Lenin question, what is to be done? Well, answer it with an Irish one, we are where we are. <laughs> and if nothing else, Brexit has politicised citizens, and it does open up the possibility of progressive and green ideas to be disseminated and, grain, and gain support. It is in politics and the people that we look for hope, to light a candle here rather than to curse the Brexit dark. And our job now is to follow Raymond Williams's view that our task now is to make hope possible, rather than how, no matter how distant that is, rather than despair convincing. And in Northern Ireland, there's a danger of deepening divisions and a rolling back of the uneven progress we have made since 1998. 
and we should remind ourselves of an old Irish saying, Erska Kayla Avaran Nadini, or to translate, we live in each other's shadows, that what unites us is prior and more important than what divides us, and now more than ever, in these politically turbulent times, to hold and promote our tender green views in political tough ways. Resistance is fertile, not futile. Thank you. Thank you for that, John. Um, just before I bring you all in, because this is the most important part of the day for Jeff, where, he, where we all um, um, talk to each other, I really would like to thank the panel. I think they've all been brilliant. I do want to stress that I see this not just as, as, a, as a problem for England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, but for the whole of Europe. There is a reform issue around the EU, but there is also a, a looming constitutional crisis in, uh, in the UK, as I think we just had heard very clearly, not just for Scotland, but from, from Northern Ireland. I myself do not think you can unite Ireland with 50% of the North or 52%. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can divide Britain from Europe by the same numbers either. Uh, so, I mean, that's clear to me. You don't bring people together by dividing them, you know, with a, a small majority. I would like to pe that people would understand Europe better and feel part of it. One of the ways that we do that brilliantly for those who go to college is the Erasmus. But we don't have a, a skills training um, of the same kind for, for people who don't go to college. I would like to see some practical... I don't see a lot of response, frankly, from the Commission or the Council on things like that. The budget um, of the whole of the EU is about 1% of the GDP of the continent. It's a small amount of money, and we get focused on that small amount of money instead of what can we do with it. I'd like to see more money in the European um, budget for things that Europeans would enjoy doing together. Uh, and, I've, and, and we don't, and so more positive stories, more compelling narratives about what uh, it, to me is a great success of the European Union that young people all over Europe can live and work anywhere in any country within the EU. For us in Ireland, that has been brilliant. I think it's also brilliant for English young people to go and do that in France. For older people in Spain, we're not hearing those stories. They're not told as stories. We're hearing a lot of facts and figures, some of them quite wrong. We're not hearing compelling stories about what it is like to be a European, especially a young European, and the advantages that we have that previous generations didn't have. I'd like to hear those stories told. So uh, over to you. Hands up. What would you like to ask the panel? Yes, go ahead. I don't think people quite heard that, but I, I would like to hear a discussion about your atom. Some people think it, it was always, well, the reason that your atom was set up in the first place was that the, the original purveyors of the European community, as it was then, were trying to get a hold of nuclear power. Of course, they failed to do that because it always stayed in the hands of Britain and France, who were the two nuclear powers. There are safety. Um, yes, there, there is important aspects of nuclear safety and safeguarding, which is probably best handled um, in Vienna, not, not through the Euratom Treaty. But let's talk about it. But I'm not a, I'm not a fan of Euratom, but of course there are some useful safeguards and safeguarding um, issues that, that that it does control. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to uh, mention that when Article 50 was uh, promulgated or whatever it uh, enforced, um, triggered, thank you, triggered, uh, there was some negotiation, there was some comment in the press about your atom and whether or not it was going to be, uh, whether that was attached to Article 50 or not, and it seemed 
the position of the press reported appeared to be that Article 50 was triggered, and then as an afterthought, oh, it includes Euratom as well. So I think it's thought that we're out of Euratom at the moment, yeah. although there have been some um, scientists saying that that's uh, a, a bad result and we ought to review that. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, thank you for that information. Sorry, confused as it was. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah. Gentleman in the blue shirt. Blue jumper. Um, uh, one of the things that we didn't, Roger Mansa, one of the things we didn't discuss this morning but could come up this afternoon is devolved, the devolved nations. And I would like to hear if any, particularly say from the German lady, because you have a very devolved situ structure in, in the Federal Republic, whether the issue of Scotland, Wales, as well as Northern Ireland has come up at all, because that for me is one of the most <coughs> critical issues is the power grab from London, mm. which I think is absolutely foul and needs to be stopped as soon as possible. directly answer and um, we don't call it a devolved system we call it a federal system and we uh, yes in Germany um, and we have uh, very vivid discussions about um, what was there first the egg or the hen and then it's like <laughs> the states or the federal whatever so there is a um, also about the federal system in Germany we have uh, very lively debates um, but I, I mean I, what I'm following on is um, certainly the situation that if Brexit happens, many of the competences that would come back to Britain would actually, if done properly, go to the devolved administrations. I mean, if, if done correctly, but in fact what the, what the government in London is trying to do is to devolve or to, to bring them back to London. Um, and I think that this is of course in line with the discussions about um, especially that Northern Ireland and Scotland voted differently, very heavily debated in Germany as well. And then the question of um, whether Theresa May is actually keeping her promise of including all parts of the United Kingdom in these negotiations, or whether it's just basically her government that is taking all the decision. And I think that the question of devolution is of course at the core there, but I would even go beyond. I mean, I'm not trying to impose my view, but I think that Molly is absolutely right when she's saying that the way that Brexit is being done by the British government right now is going against the basis of democracy. I mean, it's really um, concentrating all the power in very, very little hands. And this to me is deeply worrying, especially because the outcome is not that there is a clear position then in this government, but rather there is this infighting happening in these you know, in these circles that are meeting somewhere behind closed doors, and there is absolutely no account. There is absolutely no accountability, no transparency, and to me, very often also no understanding of what do these people actually want out of Brexit. And I think that the the question of Northern Ireland is just one example there, but also with regards to many other questions. I still don't know what the British government actually wants to be the outcome of ne these negotiations. And I think that that is very, very worrying. Mm -hmm. I don't know Would any of the other panel like to comment? <laughs> so yeah, I think I'll yeah, so just on devolution, I think, I mean, what's one of the most interesting development has been that the Scottish and Welsh government have submitted joint amendments jointly. So we are having the, to the EU withdrawal bill, so we're having the constitution of the UK changing as we speak. And I think perhaps the government is not realizing what's happening in terms of the devolved, of course, Northern Ireland not having a voice right now, but Scotland and Wales working together incredibly closely. And of course, we've got the Welsh proposal for a UK Council of Ministers. As the UK leaves the EU, the UK should import some of the EU's institution mm -hmm. in its own uh, constitutional settlement. Now, of course, that ring brings up the question of what you do in a system in which you have Th the three other nations that are so much smaller than England and England not having a parliament. I think all of these questions won't, you know, they won't stay out of the agenda for a long time because the way that Brexit is delivered is putting all of these constitutional infighting of the UK really yes. to the fore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, uh, go ahead. Sir. Hello, my name is John Gollop and I'm a, a member of 
the Green Party, but I'm also a political representative in the Channel Island of Guernsey, which had a Brexit debate. You, you've mentioned the four nations of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, and I know Ollie Scott Cato represents Gibraltar as well, in a sense. But there are places attached to Britain, historically, like the Isle of Man, Jersey, Guernsey, uh, that have complicated relationships, not unlike, say, Monaco or places like that. How, how can uh, B Brexit, especially from a Green perspective, help those islands to sustain themselves financially and economically and with <coughs> free movement of people. Can I ask you, Lucille, to comment as well before I bring the panel? Thank you. No, I, I just wanted to react to what uh, uh, Viviane and, and Terry said about the fact that in France and Germany, the question of Brexit was out of the agenda, that people were not, no longer waiting for it to, well, it was uh, after us. But I was thinking of the agenda next, next step, you see, 2019, and the fact that we are having uh, uh, European elections in 2019, and that uh, the deadline for uh, Brexit is, is March 2019, whereas elections are in June. And that we are, as uh, Eva was saying, we are having COP24 in, uh, in November um, 2018 in, in Poland, and it's I don't know if it's going to be a big COP or not, as we say in France, but I know that it's going to be a kind of midterm COP uh, after the COP21, and it means that we are going to have two, ma two, two very important events with um, the Brexit and the question of is COP21 a success or not? We are going to know that in 2018. And don't you think it might be, I mean, the Brexit and the green issues and what is going to happen might become more... Um, present in uh, people's spirit. I mean, we might, have, we might think that Brexit is forgotten, but it might be revived. This is what I, s I think, because uh, very often, you know, this is a political agenda. People forget, and then they think of it. And so the question of how, what's going to happen in next European elections, uh, is nationalistic forces going to be very important because of Brexit? Um, are we going to have um, a failed COP24 because it wa it's going to be in Poland, sorry, Eva. Mm -hmm. But don't you think that nationalistic and anti-green uh, might be strong in next European elections because of these two elements? I, I'm going to bring Vivian in and then I'm going to ask you all to comment on those various questions, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with reference to the Channel Islands. But mm -hmm. Vivian? So uh, about the Channel Island <coughs> question, I think one of the avenues of hope institutionally is the British Irish Council and also the Joint Ministerial Council. So there's, there's the idea that you have, as we are not going to get a UK Council of Ministers, that perhaps the pre-existing institutions might be revitalized. I think there's questions about who th whether they, these institutions are then taken seriously by the UK government or not. And I think for now it doesn't appear they are. So we have first ministers coming, but never prime ministers, yeah. these kind of things. So I think in terms of showing that London cares about the rest of these islands, it would be nice to have high level representatives there. Now just on whether Brexit can come back around the 2019 election, European election, I think what matters really much for the 2019 European election is for the Green Movement and for environmentalists in general to be able to talk about Europe to European citizens and to go back and talk more about Europe. I think the EU referendum was that the Green Movement in the UK was one of the the only group potentially who actually tried to have a positive message about Europe in this EU referendum. It was not just about the money and I think we really need at a time of rising populism across Europe we need a positive message as well and we need to talk about ideas, we need to talk about feelings and not just hard numbers when it comes to Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would like to speak uh, about COP24 in uh, Katowice in Poland uh, next year. It will be an uh, extremely important COP because the definite version of uh, Paris Agreement will be agreed there. It means all those nationally determined uh, contributions that put together must make less than two degrees from the beginning of industrial area. What 
what is we know already extremely difficult. And a new report, there, were, there was a new report launch uh, of uh, uh, Friends of the Earth uh, uh, showing that we have uh, about nine years, really, to get out of uh, fossil fuels, uh, new fossil fuels, if we want to think about this seriously. So we, we are in very important period. And uh, uh, really, it's uh, why it's in Poland? Because Polish government is making a big manipulation. Poland was the only country that proposed to organize those COP immediately when they took power because they wanted to uh, uh, manipulate those negotiations. What is the, the Polish uh, strategy? Is to make believe all the world that it's possible to um, absorb all the emissions of fossil fuels by uh, uh, smart management of forests. And uh, uh, so, so there is a big program of uh, uh, carbon forest farms with a Polish program <laughs> of uh, uh, scientific research how to measure the absorptions uh, of CO2 by those forests to show that it's something that uh, can uh, uh, let Poland to burn coal still for, for one century, absorbing all those emissions through the forest. So it will be mathematical, methodological, and uh, you know, this kind of game. It will be uh, net emissions. We are fighting for the net emissions on paper. It will not save the planet. So that's something, and there are other countries that are entering in this game. Sweden is supporting very hardly this program. All the countries that have many forests are supporting this program. So, so we must be very careful about what's going on in uh, Bonn and what will be done in between, and uh, uh, really work on all kind of scientific works and practical works to show that this is a lie. And if it means it's not important to, to plant beaches to absorb more uh, CO2, it's important, but in plus, not instead of the phase out of fossil fuels. And we must be there, and Greens mi must be there uh, at COP24, really to, to, to work with uh, ecological organizations, to put pressure of the Polish presidency, and uh, to make those NDCs as ambitious as possible and not let uh, us uh, burn the planet. Well, a number of uh, topics came came up here, and uh, as, as I said, I, I think the the Brexit issue will potentially come back. It, it will come and go depending on what's happening uh, uh, in the negotiations between UK and the EU, and how that relates to the national debate. Because if there's one thing that's clear, uh, that is, we we have no common EU press mm. or media. Uh, the media debate takes place within uh, member states on a national basis. So unless you have this clear link to the national debate, for instance, there will be an election in Sweden next year, and the populists might use this depending on the outcome. Uh, if they will, um, if, if UK will get a good outcome that will be used by the populists in Sweden to say, let's leave EU as well. And that is, of course, something that is influencing the positions taken now by the Swedish government. Uh, don't give them, even though no one wants to punish the UK, don't give them a too good deal, because that might just trigger and stimulate Euroscepticism within Sweden. And, and you know, Sweden had a very, on, on average, uh, majority against joining um, the EU, uh, except for six weeks before and six weeks after the referendum in 1994, then we had a negative majority again for a number of years. But 
I would say the last five years at least, the, the majority is positive and the Greens eventually understood that Sweden is a part of Europe and changed, uh, the previous two spokespersons. But I also think one reason why this will come up is that I have this very nice picture, I don't have it linked here, from Bloomberg, Europe's ties that bind, which shows the European Union, the Eurozone, EFTA, Customs Union, Schengen Area, and it's, it's a hybrid. They talk about two-speed Europe. Uh, well, we have five or six different speeds already uh, here. And uh, the thing that makes UK uh, pop up now and then and Brexit in the debate is not so much that we have one EU and one another EU without UK. It, it is that the, the, the bubble here of UK is so huge and large and for uh, a trading nation like Sweden, which shares positions on agriculture and budget, etc., with the UK. Of course, that comes up now and then in, 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 in the debate. Um, when it comes to positive stories about Europe, of course they are needed. My key concern here is that President Juncker is now sort of trying to meet the European versions of the Tea Party supporters by a kind of race to the bottom. That is extremely problematic, and I think the green, uh, green, the, the, the green organisations and the green movement could hopefully counter and try to try to meet that. On climate, I could talk for a long time. I will not do that. But one particularly important thing next year is the special report on 1.5 degrees that the IPCC is charged with uh, delivering after the Paris Agreement, because that will, on the one hand, underline. Uh, the extreme risks we are running or the extreme problems we will meet. On the other hand, it might be instrumental in showing people that there is actually a scenario, there are ways out of this mess as well, going down well below two in the direction towards 1.5. We should not rule out uh, extreme, extremely high costs and problems, uh, but we should not rule out either the possibility of actually coping with this. Everything is about probabilities in these cases as well. We don't know much about climate sensitivities at 1.5 or 4.5 degrees, and, and that's not even researchable. Uh, so uh, biofuels and forests and in relation to climate have, have been mentioned now and then, and also in the previous panels. You cannot talk about biofuels as if it would, would, would be one thing. It would be like the political parties in the UK have this opinion. I mean, biofuel depends on, and, and I'm fortunate that that's something half of the European environmental movement and the Greens in the European Parliament have not understood. There are beneficial biofuels and there are problematic biofuels, and we need to support the first and press the others, and, and we don't have that policy in place. That's really problematic, the simplification of that issue. Euratom, um, well, what I want to mention besides Euratom, I mean, all nuclear power plants are too risky and the new ones are too expensive. Nuclear power will be phased out and die, which is good. But it's just a speed bump. Um, what's important, though, in the negotiations between UK and the EU is to keep control of the state aid rules because it will definitely be problematic if the UK would in the future not be forced to comply with state aid rules and can uh, subsidize all industries or race to the bottom and, and in doing so, attract all fashion types of industries that will uh, lead to a kind of race to the bottom um, push in, in, in uh, I was nearly saying, the rest of the EU, but in the remaining EU, the real EU then, <laughs> without UK. So, so once again, it's important not give in on a millimeter even on in the negotiations. UK needs to follow fully uh, environmental policy and laws and, and state aid laws. And, well, the rest as well, and 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 well, then you can just stay. Well, since you're doing it anyway. And <laughs> um, yeah, I would absolutely agree that the debates in the 27 will start once we talk about the future agreement. I mean, now we have until December. Let's see if we will have sufficient progress by then. But after that, when we really speak about what kind of future relationship will the EU and Britain have if Brexit is to happen, um, then there will be fights because there are different visions of that amongst the member states and also amongst the political parties in the European Parliament. So, so far, ah, sorry. 
So far, just to tell you, every time we had a resolution adopted in the European Parliament, it was a huge majority across all groups. Because on the main lines, everybody agrees at the moment. But as soon as we talk about what kind of you know, possible free trade agreement would the UK get, what kind of special rules would apply, whatever, there will be more disagreement and then it will come back up. In terms of what do I think we need to do in the uh, 2019 European elections, I think what was the main problem of the Remain campaign and I think this is also a problem that we sometimes face when we speak about Europe in general, there was a very emotional leave campaign that was, you know, speaking about identity control and so on and so on. And the countering from the Remain side was a lot of facts and figures. So we were basically calculating to people why it is economically wiser to be in the European Union. And I think that, of course, we have the arguments on our side. Um, I still think it doesn't really convince people when they're facing this really emotionalizing campaign. So I would like to see a very emotional campaign in 2019, while at the same time talking about the problems that we have in the European Union, and I think Caroline said it and some others as well, there is a lot of reform that we need to do in the European Union because we have you know, climate change, but we also have rising inequalities in the European Union. You know, All these, these issues we need to bring up, while at the same time say, in, in general, the direction of this pro, uh, pr um, project is the right one. And I just wanted to give you one specific example because you were mentioning migration before. I think that limiting migration is not what I would see as the tool of convincing people again. Because I think that indeed what could happen is basically you are kind of giving in to the arguments of the right side. Because I think, why are people skeptical towards migration? I think there is a, a racist aspect in, in it, that people just feel they don't want people who are different from them. But I think on the other hand, there is, of course, a substantial political point that some people have, because there is wage dumping in the European Union, there is social dumping, and we need to tackle these issues. But then instead of pointing to the Polish plumber, what you should say is, the Polish plumber is welcome to come here, but then he or she should have the same working conditions and the same pay like people who are uh, working here in a, in a British uh, labor contract, yeah? And these kind of tools we already have on the European level, we just need to enforce them and we need to extend them. And we need to say there needs to be equality of treatment whether your nationality is Polish, Romanian or British or German. And I think then if people see that the European Union is actually a tool to safeguard these social rights and it's not you know, bringing them competition from other countries where wages are lower, then they are also more open to you know, furthering the European pro project and opening up for it again. This would be what I think is the, the more likely to be successful strategy when we talk about what kind of European Union we want to have. Yes, yeah, so I just want to make a, a few comments. With, with the gentleman. And the great tragedy for, for Northern Ireland is that, you know, without saying that the agreement wasn't perfect, much like the European Union, um, Northern Ireland was beginning to gesture towards what I think is a, is a very green vision of the place where these islands overlap where actually the, the, the synergies and the hybridities of British, Irish, Scottish people could start to you know, be seen not as a problem, but as something to be celebrated. And that's all now being uh, put in jeopardy as a result of, of what's happened. Because the, mem the joint membership of, of the UK and Ireland, they both joined at the same time, obviously, it, it, it lessened some of those former uh, colonized uh, grievances that people in the Republic of Ireland had. Uh, culminating when the visit of the Queen happened uh, a few years ago. I mean, that, I, I think for most people, maybe outside of Ireland, didn't realise the big, deep psychological, cultural significance, particularly when Her Majesty, who of course had relatives killed by the IRA, bowed her head to Irish uh, revolutionaries uh, that founded the Irish state. And there was a great sense of reconciliation actually going ahead, and the symbolism uh, was all there. That's all now been thrown into doubt, never mind the EU funding for uh, peace initiatives in, in Northern Ireland. But just on the issue of, a, I think maybe there seems to be a consensus around the importance of Viviane and Terry and others talking about the importance of, you don't defeat a, a story or a myth with facts. You beat it with a better story. And that was the big problem, of course, that we had with the Project Fear, fact-driven, uh, you know, Remain campaign. And, you know, although I speak now not just as a lapsed Catholic, but a completely collapsed one, um, <laughs> I do think there are some good marketing tips in the Bible, uh, one, of one of which is, without vision, there the people perish. 
And I do think often we feel ourselves on a kind of a Kubler-Ross grief or chain cycle. I don't know where we are in terms of shock, denial, anger, frustration, depression. These are all normal parts of that emotional reaction that many of us felt. And of course, you get the situation of anger leading to action and then uh, a re resolution. I just want to leave you with uh, um, a quote from a poem by W.B. Yeats, the second coming, which I think is rather appropriate. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. And now the important bit. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. just like to cap that by saying in the famous words of John Donne, no man is an island entire of itself. Everyone is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Rupert, and then yourself. I just want to say something about the climate issue and the way we're debating it. So we in Greenhouse, our new project is called Facing Up to Climate Reality. Uh, and the reason we've launched this is because we think that none of us really are very good at facing up to climate reality. So we, we, we heard, for instance, a few minutes ago that we've got nine or ten years to, to rein in uh, dangerous climate change and really change the world economy and so on. But I remember um, a campaign called 100 Months. Mm. Uh, and guess how many months have passed since that campaign started, folks? Well, it's about 112. Hi. Yeah. Um, and um, well, either we didn't mean it then uh, or we need to take the consequences more seriously. I think we did mean it then, I think it was right. Basically, the 100 Months campaign said, unless we have massive transformation within the next few years, we're gonna start to pass uh, tipping points. And that seems to be what's happening, right? That seems to be what's happening as we look at the way the actual world's climate is changing uh, in the last few years. So I really think that we have to, um, as well as obviously continuing to talk about uh, how do we prevent uh, dangerous climate change and uh, being precautious and so on and so forth, we actually have to talk a lot more about adaptation uh, and we have to talk a lot more about loss and damage. Uh, and we have to admit that actually um, the green transition in as much as it's happening is happening way too slowly, way, way too slowly. Uh, and that we are going to almost certainly bequeath to the future a deteriorated world. Uh, and um, that isn't the kind of thing that we like to face very much, but that is reality. Uh, and part of what that means, I think, as I was implying earlier, is, is that we actually do have to look with, with a little bit more kind of uh, steely, open eyes at some of the challenges we're going to have in the future. For example, this country only able to produce 60% of its food. How long is it going to be before we get another food crisis like we had in 2007, 2008, where most countries in the world for a period of several months, stopped exporting any food at all. Um, and where will Britain be uh, when that uh, next happens? So uh, I would love the panel's response on this. Um, how can we get better at uh, facing up to uh, climate reality and the, the many consequences I think this has for the way we talk and the way we plan? Thank you. I'll take a few more questions. The gentleman there in the black jacket. There. Thank you very much. Um, this builds actually on what Rupert said. Um, on the theme of what is the vision, what is the, what is the message, I think Europeans and people in the UK are hungry for a message which is relevant to adaptation. And last year I was doing some work with some architects and I learned about the Netherlands and the Ponga model and the approach that that country had taken, knowing it was low-lying, low to the North Sea. And people learned over hundreds of years they had to cooperate to build the walls, to build the dikes. And there is an opportunity for the EU to be relevant to the big threats mm. of which Rupert has mentioned. Adaptation, food security, the automation of jobs, and the failure of the EU, because it has been a failure, the failure of the EU to be agile and relevant and winning hearts and minds in the UK is a large part of the lack of love of British people for the EU as an in, as a institution. It's not too late, but the answer must, must involve a better use of the media. And I did not know until half an hour ago that the EU does not have a channel of news. It doesn't have a newspaper. Well, there is the new European, perhaps we could build 
on, on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, one more quick question. And yes, a quick question. I, I, I'd like to question Michael's comment that we should, that whatever happens, we should be abandoned, we should all keep to the EU state aid rules. I think that the fact that I would be really interested to hear whether everyone else agrees with that, because I find that surprising. Because I think that's one of the important things about if we're going to move to a degrowth or climate change controlled society, we're going to need a lot of state aid, direct, well directed. So I find that really surprising that no one's questioned that. Uh, thank you for that. My own experience of the nuclear industry is that it was insulated from the state aid rules. So um, just to put that in the pot as well. So um, please, I'll start again with Viviane. Um, I think I'll start with the state aid rules as you know, being a French person here and having you know, <laughs> the bigger nuclear industry. I think what matters is that we don't have diverging state aid rules. I think it would be great if we could have reform to some stated rules to help for an ecological transition in Europe. But we need to have that EU-wide, otherwise we're going to have really growing problems between the two, like between the UK and the EU. And I think in general, there's lots of that have been said about how you can apply stated rules, and some countries have been much better at you know, applying them in a green way than others. Now, I think the, the question that gentleman at the back raised around the question of solidarity around migrants and citizens. I think as a European citizen living in the UK, the last year has been very interesting in that we've had lots of negative comments, but also lots of positive support for European citizens in this country. But I think it kind of raises a pack of this different class of migrants, right, in the UK. And there's European citizens, people are now rallying behind European citizens to a degree that people were not rallying behind migrants coming from outside of Europe that have been treated appallingly for years and years. Mm -hmm. And now that there's questions about perhaps European migrants will, citizens will be treated as badly, now we should talk about this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite problematic. I mean, as a European citizen, I benefit from the fact that UK citizens are, you know, rallying up. And that's <coughs> great. But at the same time, I think there's a question of solidarity. And it's the same on the continent. It's great to have the sit all the EU countries wanting to have rights of citizens taken care of during Brexit, but it would be nice that if they also took care of the refugees. So I think there's questions about the solidarity that has to go beyond Europe uh, in how we think about humankind. Uh, yes, I, I would like to speak about two things. First, what to do, so what is the hope and where must we, we act? Um, there is life uh, after Brexit, and the European Union is not the only place to act. And there are other networks and other possibilities. <coughs> One of them is our cities and the cooperation of cities. Don't forget that most of us live in cities now, and they are extremely powerful. So uh, the one of example is, is the network of uh, what we call municipalism, fearless cities. Barcelona is one of leaders, one of best examples. There was a, a second conference this year in Barcelona, and they are very progressive, uh, modern, green, open cities. So mm, uh, uh, this uh, is something that can be followed and. Uh, uh, as uh, political activists, together with uh, social movements, urban movements, we can form coalitions to take power in the cities and to transform them as Barcelona and uh, Comu did with Ada Colau, wonderful example of really excellent action of citizens and uh, Greens and left-wing uh, parties together to transform cities. And uh, the, the other mm, uh, thing that I would like to speak about is, uh, are those migrants. We are uh, telling all the time about solidarity, 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 and we don't speak about responsibility because we forget that there are millions of 
climate victims and climate refugees. And it's our historical responsibility of developed world to take the responsibility for our level of life, for all the historical emissions <coughs> we transform their life. Uh, COP, COP is a wonderful place to listen about that and to uh, to hear all those stories. For example, one of conference when I was uh, yesterday or, uh, or two days ago was someone from Chad who showed us the story of the Lac Chad who had uh, 25,000 square kilometers in 63 and who has 2,500 kilometers now, square, uh, square kilometers. And there was 1,400,000 people moved so all those people must go somewhere. All the economy was completely disturbed. So, uh, and it's just one of examples. And all those climatic migrants, we, we will have more and more of them. And even if Syria, there was droughts before there were, there was uh, movements and war. So, uh, so if we look very clearly on many uh, conflicts, uh, military conflict and war, there are climatic reasons before. So, uh, so that's something that we must not uh, forget and that's something that we must show as our responsibility of developed countries because everything that we wear, our cars, everything, there is a cost, uh, there is an environmental and human cost after that. Well, a couple of points. First, thank you for, for the question about the state aid rules. Uh, there are two aspects of it. One, one is, of course, when you, when you subsidize or lower demands on dirt industries, th that's the negative aspect. Uh, th then you have, of course, we need massive investments for transformations, and, and that's an area where these guidelines and, and, I mean, from the Constitution to the directive regulations and the guidelines are extremely uh, problematic, I would say. <coughs> also, I actually wrote a report on these issues to, to the Swedish Parliamentary Committee that presented uh, with the UK Climate Change Act as, as, as a model, uh, and they presented and Parliament adopted an even more ambitious uh, climate act in Sweden, zero emissions by 2045. Uh, but, yeah, so I just mentioned one aspect of that, so thanks for that clarification. When it comes to refugees and, and migrants, I, I don't really like these concepts or names. Of, the, of course, it's instrumental, but I, I, I think of them as friends, <laughs> uh, fellow beings. And I, I hate borders. Borders are, I mean, a border is one of the worst things that humanity has ever in invented and understood. Fortunately, I live in Sweden where we are quite positive and I think per capita Sweden uh, took most immigrants um, in the entire Europe in, in absolute number Germany but in terms per capita Sweden actually the, Sween, the, the Greens in Sweden in the government together with social democrats decided to shut down the borders and, and we went from the most liberal to the most not the most but one of a, a really problematic position and I think that's one of the key explanations why the Greens went down the other one is that they were stupid enough to promise to <coughs> close down coal mines in the, in, in the election campaign. And of course, they knew already then that that would be impossible. So they had to eat that. <coughs> but on, on climate policy, the Greens have really delivered now. So that argument against them is gone. But the migration um, crisis is a, a crisis for the Greens in Sweden, definitely, which is problematic. <coughs> when, when it comes to, well, climate change, uh, I. I've been doing that for <laughs> 25 or 30 years, been thinking about is these issues. And so I have to summarize it a bit, but <clears throat> when I was chair of the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation, which is the largest environmental organization in Sweden, we had this internal debate, should you talk about hopes or problems? Or should you believe in, in, in changing things within the frame, a kind of ecological modernization idea, or do we need to reinvent institutions, consider reflexive modernization, um, uh, change values. And of course we need to do both things. If you just talk about problems, uh, people will not follow you. If you just talk about solutions, people will relax. We need to do both. And of course we need to apply the entire ecological modernization uh, idea 
polluted Paris principle, phase out harmful subsidies, environmental tax reform, label, corporate social responsibility, the whole program. <clears throat> and at the same time, think about institutions, think about values. If we just change prices but not values, prices will of course be not sufficient. But if we are not changing the prices until we have changed the values, the planet will burn before. <clears throat> I wrote actually another report to this parliamentary committee uh, on, on climate economics and uh, to summarize that, of course, we concluded like many others have done before, this is the most expensive thing that mankind has ever done. <clears throat> and all the arguments are in favor of taking measures. The, the problem uh, the last decade in Europe are, it is rather to meet the arguments against taking measures. Um, in particular on EU level, this generates uh, lower employment, it's anti-growth for those who think that GDP is good, um, which I learned 25 years ago in 25 year old textbook that GDP is a lousy concept for welfare. <coughs> anyway, people still think it's valuable, uh, that this is bad for competitiveness, profits, etc. So we need to meet those counter arguments at the same time as we underline the problems. And fortunately now, individual companies, and they were also present in the, in, in the Swedish committee, they were present in Paris in negotiations, individual companies understand this and can really show. So I, I think we need, don't choose between f facts and, and um, emotions. We need, <laughs> I mean, logos, ethos, pathos was the Greek rhetoric. Uh, we, need, we need the facts and the better stories, and they actually go hand in hand nowadays. Um, what was really problematic in this Swedish committee was Business Sweden, the branch organization, the confederations. They sat in the corner of this committee and they said all the time, what does it cost? What does it cost? What does it cost? And I said to them, important question, but we need to think about what does it cost not to do it. And that's five to ten times more expensive at least. If we take free degree world into consideration even more, it's 100 to 1,000 times more expensive, or e e even more. I mean, no mankind is quite expensive <coughs> with human violation. Um, so, and we also need to think about what are the co-benefits? And it, it's actually two zero, because the, 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 the costs for mitigation are much lower than the cost for no action, and the co-benefits are much larger than the cost for mitigation. And the individual companies are now coming up more and more. In Sweden, that's the narrative today. Companies benefit from this. So when Business Sweden said, together with the trade unions, that, well, you know, you talk about 2040 or 2050, and they agreed on 2045. We think zero emissions should be achieved by 2100. The parliamentarians from the conservative to the left party said, bye bye business Sweden. You're 55 years too late. We don't care about you any longer. We don't care about the largest trade unions. We, we agree seven parties, not the racists, they are doing something else, but um, calling themselves Democrats, for instance. But <laughs> anyway, so these seven parties agreed uh, and they were informed by a lot of small and large businesses who said that, well, we need to do this, and this is actually profitable. So don't come to us as corporations with arguments that climate change mitigation and adaptation is bad for business, it's good for business. And of course, that needs to be weighted in the, in the much larger social economic uh, story and, and the things that we don't have moral rights to do this as well. But it's very helpful, of course, if the companies are saying it as well. So what I would say is that we need to do all these things. And one problem in the environmental movement sometimes is that some persons say, well, you can't talk with companies who say that it's profitable because then you're selling yourself to the devil. We need to talk about the problems and problems and problems. Or to do the other way around, just to talk about the good stories without talking about the problems. And I mean, I, yeah, we have limited time. I could go on, but just to give you one. In the 1980s, the Swedish environmental debate was completely occupied with acidification, seals were dying, we had a Chernobyl accident, 1985 hole in the ozone layer, uh, and, and nuclear, I mean, nuclear war. I, I grew up I was depressed. So we had a fight about the rivers and forests in North Sweden. 
really a lot of alarms, alarms, alarms. And the members of the environmental movements increased, the membership increased, but there were no ideas or solutions coming up. 1990s was eco-labeling, environmental tax reform, environmental objective systems, a new environmental code, Rio conference, uh, you, you could give names to the worms in the compost and things like that. So the, the number of members went down because everything was, well, everything is fixed. Since then, we learned to do both. And now the environmental movement in Sweden is stronger than ever. Politics is much better than ever. And people understand that we need to go beyond and look at the root causes as well. Thank you. Terry. OK, I think, I think I can be pretty quick now, because many things have already been said. Um, I think when we talk about facing climate reality, I'm actually really happy that you chose that as the title because I think that's what it is, no? facing climate reality. And I think that's also the first step. We have a major backlash. And I mean, I just saw a video of, I think, the new US American ambassador to Canada. And she was arguing about how, you know, we should always look at all sides of the argument. <laughs> so she believes that there are scientists who say that climate change is human made, but there are also credible sources that would argue differently. And as politicians, and you know, as blah, we always have to look at both sides. And I just thought, okay, if we give in to these kind of you know discussion uh, contributions, we are doomed because we need to act now. And if we have to look at all of the arguments, also of some crazy people sitting in the White House, then we are not going to get enough traction to really get something going. So I think we need to firmly stand and fight against you know climate denying and really clearly say that this is not one side of, this is not one way of looking at it, it's simply false what these people are saying who call themselves scientists. And then I think secondly, and this is a little bit the challenge also when I look at EU climate policy, because what we have to do when it comes to fighting climate change, I think it's two movements at the same time. On the one hand, we need to put something on a higher level, because I do believe we need to have joint objectives, we need to move into the same direction, we need to come together, multilateralism is very important. But at the same time, we also have to massively decentralize. Because if we want to win this fight, we need to have more decentralized supply chain, we need to have a more decentralized energy grid, we need to have more decentralized economies, and so on and so on. And I think that the European Union is really failing at bringing these two ideas together efficiently mm -hmm. still today. And I'm talking about the European Union not as Brussels, but also as all European governments, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, one of the problems that we see is what was Peter was speaking about earlier, is that there is still in the setup of the European Union, but I would argue this also for most capitals, definitely Berlin, that we have some companies, really big multinational companies, that claim to present the business perspective, which is actually nonsense, because most of the smaller and, small and medium-sized enterprises actually massively benefit from climate change policies that have been implemented. But because these big companies have a lot of money to have lobbyists sitting around the European Parliament, around the German Parliament, around possibly yeah. here as well, they have a very loud voice. And I think we need to be absolutely clear that they cannot be the voice even only of the business sector and certainly not of the whole discussion that we have around climate. And then I hope that we can move forward. And I mean, what gives me a lot of hope, if I was mentioning Bonn before, in Bonn last weekend, there was the biggest anti-coal demonstration ever in history. So this is a very living, vivid, and big movement that we have. And I think we shouldn't be afraid of all these you know, people who are trying to tell us that climate change actually doesn't exist, or big uh, lobbyists, but rather also here be revolutionary and, and pick the moment. And one last point, if you further would like to discuss about this question, energy transition, also on the local level, and if you happen to be a member of the Green Party in the UK, in Scotland, uh, in Ireland, we have, sorry, this is a little bit my advertisement blog. Um, <laughs> We have a, a, an exchange conference between the Green Party of England and Wales, but also from Ireland and Scotland, everybody's warmly invited, and the German Greens on the 1st of December in, um, in Berlin. So if you would like to continue this discussion, because I do think that we will have a lot to talk about um, still then, uh, you are very warmly invited for this. Thanks. I certainly agree with Terry in terms of, yes, uh, reducing supply uh, chains and localization. But also our vision must have organic worker cooperative brewed beer as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always uh, up for beer. 
to pick up on, on Rupert's point, the, the urgency framing sometimes worries me. And I, don't, and I know you don't mean it like this. It's that wartime mobilization and, and the securitization agenda. Uh, the way in which that can become not in the way that you, you, you mean it. But it's that gentle or dance or difficulty in terms of you know, talking about the urgency and facing up the climate reality, but at the same time detaching it uh, from that apocalyptic framing that I think has dominated climate politics uh, for quite some time. I often tell my students that you know, I'm not depressed, but I think I'm a carrier. Um, because if you do climate politics and you look at some of the you know, uh, projections, these are trips through the apocalypse in terms of what's coming before us. And of course, the reality is that you fix the roof when it's sunny, not when it's raining. And that's why the urgency is, is, is now to, to save us money uh, doing it um, later on. And I'm, I'm buoyed up by this kind of co co-optation or um, Trojan horse strategy that perhaps Molly introduced earlier on about you know, using that phrase, taking back control, but subverting it and using it for our own purposes. My own suggestion in this case is to take back innovation from its big tech connotations in the climate debate. There is an immeasurably more money, public discourse around geoengineering, and not into new experiments and low carbon ways of living that are either low carbon or low energy, but still deliver on high levels of human flourishing. So I'd like to see us more take back that language of, of innovation, but put it in a, in a social context. And I'm also reminded by a, a phrase here, and you, you'll be aware of it, uh, certainly uh, Pete and, and Rupert and others, of Mike Hume, the climate scientist, who said, you know, it's not what we can do for the climate, but what the climate can do for us in terms of the creative possibilities of cultural renewal that dealing with the climate crisis can actually, and that issue of the, the excitement that you know, can be generated by this revolutionary or, or transformative change that could be introduced. I think in terms, I think uh, Ray is quite right in terms of often we're dreaming uh, too small. It seems to me that if the EU could attach itself to a project around people, planet and place, that encouraged selective deglobalization, enhanced local self-reliance in the way that we spoke about this morning uh, with the report that Rupert and, uh, and Victor did and, and so on, I think then it may have a, have a chance. And I think it is an issue, and this is a plug for Pete Newell's work, that we need to move beyond transitions talk to transformations. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also have to recognise that, again speaking from Northern Ireland, that it's becoming ever more clear to me now, certainly in the divestment movement and decarbonisation, there are lessons to be learned from introducing conflict management processes in our thinking already. And this is not just about that there's going to be winners and losers, uh, but actually we, there are such a scale of the changes that we're facing that we do have to have some forethought, how do we manage conflict? Which is why I began my talk earlier on with, uh, it sounds like a very bizarre green way of describing it. I think it's a green way of describing it. Democracy is non-violent disagreement, uh, with the emphasis, of course, on, on, on the non-violence. But we should not shy away from robust debate. Mm. Uh, we should not shy away from agonistic, as opposed to antagonistic, uh, discussions and so on, even amongst ourselves. And I'd just like to leave you now with a poem from Vaclav Havel called Hope. Hope is a state of mind, not a state of the world. Either we have hope within us or we don't. Hope is not a prognostication, it's an orientation of the spirit. You can't delegate that to anybody else. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy when things are going well, or the willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success, but rather an ability to work for something to succeed. Hope is definitely not the same as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. Thank you. I'd like to thank the panel, who've been very thoughtful and reflective, and I'd certainly like to thank the audience for your great participation. Um, we have a lot to do. I'd also like to now invite Jean Lambert to come forward and reflect to us with her closing remarks. <laughs> Keynote listener. <laughs> Keynote listener. Welcome. Oh yes, it's on the table. Okay, thank you. So I've got the um, easy job now of trying to sort of 
sum up and reflect. And I have to say, whenever I get a microphone in my hand like this, I always feel I ought to sing, but <laughs> you've suffered, maybe <laughs> suffered enough sing in your lives you so want. far. Um, one of the things that, I mean, a lot obviously has been happening today, a lot of ideas and so on. So what some of them that have struck me is that I realized recently I have been a Green Party member now for mm, a very long time. Um, I think uh, actually 40 years. I worked it out, which is longer than some people in this room have been alive. And during that time, I think it's so fair to say that the party's position on the European Union has changed and changed significantly. When I first stood for election to the European Parliament back in the days before proportional representation, when you, you almost used to weigh the votes of those who, who were winning in my area, it was, it was Labour, Alf Lomas, that, you know, the first time I stood was on basically the slogans of better out than in. Um, and, uh, you know, it was about withdrawal from the European Union because it wasn't necessarily so long after the first referendum. Um, of course, held to get the Labour Party out of a mess at that time. And our position has gradually, I think, been shifting in that time. And part of the, the sort of, not only because I think we got elected, but also, you know, and some would say captured by Brussels, but I think also because the world itself has changed enormously, absolutely in that time. The balance of powers are changing, the issues that we're facing are changing. And that, you know, when we're looking at the role of the European Union, um, yes, we can be critical of it. I think sometimes as Greens we are maybe too critical of it and forget to actually say why it's important. And that, you know, I think this is one of the lessons that I would draw from the referendum here, is that in all of those years that the UK Inde Independence Party has been using its money, its resources from Brussels to inexorably talk about this is wrong, this is incompetent, they can't do their budgets, they can't get their books audited, which is wrong, etc., 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 let alone the money that people like Roger Helmer spent on huge great billboards in his constituency, basically saying what a waste of money it was spending anything on combating climate change, because, you know, basically there was nothing you could do about it. That all of that time that that was going on, I think that what we failed to realize that it was almost nobody felt it was their job, it wasn't anybody's job to really be answering that back equally forcefully, loudly, um, and truthfully. You know, partly because there's legislation to be done to try and make the European Union a better place, to make life better for people living within it, whether that's on questions of food safety, um, you, your rights at work or whatever else it is. And so I think that one of the things we have to be careful of in any campaign that we're going to be doing about Europe in future as the wider green movement is to actually remember to remind people at times why it matters. And that for all of the faults and we can list those. Greens are very good at doing what's wrong, if, uh, if you see what I mean in terms of listing what's wrong. Whoops. We live lives of impeccable integrity, of course. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that we also have to re remember to say why it matters. And for me, one of the great tragedies, uh, and I see it that way, of the referendum result, where I'm linking things about my thinking on climate and the European Union, is that we are walking away from a body which, because we work across borders and are diminishing them, we are walking away from possible climate adaptation mechanisms, whether that's about how we produce our food but actually can share it better maybe at times of crisis, that when the Mediterranean is burning, we can still produce food here, and that if we're drowning, we can maybe produce food elsewhere and we can share that. And that free movement is a migration adaptation mechanism when we're looking at displacement. 
I think it's also something which redresses something of the power imbalance between business owners and employers and workers. And of course, it's been about reciprocal rights. And I think that that's something which is important. But also when we're talking about the EU, and we need to be thinking about which are the bits of it that are working, we need to be much stronger too, I think, about calling out our governments on their actions or inactions within the context of the European Union. Because again, I think something that we've learned from the referendum is that a number of things that were said about what it was doing to workers' rights, etc., that you could turn around and say, but actually, UK government, if you want to enforce the minimum wage, you can enforce it. If you actually want to do something in terms of improving workers' rights, you can do that. There's nothing that says you can't go higher than what the EU gives you. And that one of the things, too, when we've been talking about the refugee situation in the European Union, and it's something I was saying in the referendum, was that if the Commission was this all-powerful body in front of which we all had to bow, actually, we had a solution to the refugee situation, which was that countries work together in solidarity to help each other out and to share that responsibility. The EU had that, the Commission had that solution. The European Parliament had voted in favour of it. It was certain just that a number of EU national governments decided that they weren't going to do it even though their Home Office ministers, in many cases, had signed up. I mean, that was a slightly surreal moment, but they did. Then took it back, and their own, parliament, their own government said, no way, in many cases. So when we're looking at Brexit, um, and the negotiation, the situation at the moment, and this, because it's closing remarks, will dance all over the place, even though I have a dodgy knee and dancing is difficult at the moment. <laughs> I think one of the things that we sometimes tend to forget at the UK side of it is that um, it is actually a negotiation, and that British um, politics doesn't really like negotiation. Negotiation is weak. You know, you've given something away where you have to be strong, and you either have to be that strong and reliable government, or you have to be the opposition. And the idea that you might actually have to negotiate and go in with an idea about what your framework is and what your room for manoeuvre is, and to say to the people doing the negotiation, well, you can give a bit on this, but you give, keep that back. I mean, European Parliament, we often design this into the results that we put on the table. And we say, well, we'll give them this. This is a bit radical. Council won't like it. We'll take it away, but we'll save that. You know, we go in with a position ready to negotiate. I don't think that the UK has really got their heads around that at all. And part of it also, of course, is because they're still negotiating within you know, the cabinet. But it's 28 parties, 28, you know, national governments engaged in this negotiation as well. This isn't Barnier. Barnier is the spokesperson. He's the one sent to do the job. So that when we're looking at this, it's got to be unanimity amongst the other governments for whatever deal the UK wants out of it. And I think when we're looking at this, though we have to remember that a lot of those countries are doing genuine impact assessments. Some of them have actually published some of those impact assessments. And that that also has to be taken into account on the UK side of it. We're not even clear that the UK really wants a deal point that was raised today. If you're going in to negotiate, do you really want a deal? Or are you prepared, as we keep hearing, well, we're going to walk away and then let them, ha, huh, you know, they'll have to give us what they want. Their card business needs it. Even though we know that what we're hearing from the German car industry is that the single market is more important than the British market. And of course, the single market was something that Margaret Thatcher really pushed for. So that when we're looking at this, it, what the UK seems to want is a trade deal. But actually, it's more than that that's in it. Even Theresa May has talked about wanting to stay in with some of the security architecture there, which the UK has helped to create and effectively you know, has been leading on that. It's questions about the agencies. Caroline was mentioning a number of them earlier on. When we're looking at do we want to re remain in the emissions trading scheme, all of these different things that we still don't know what it is that the British government wants. And yet it's putting in artificial deadlines 
in order to pull the Conservative Party behind Theresa May, don't you dare vote against leaving on the, you know, the 28th or the 29th at 11 o'clock, as Barnier put back, sent back Central European time. Um, it, it's a negotiation after all. So, you know, I think, and, but the EU does want a deal. The EU likes legal certainty. Businesses want legal certainty. Its citizens certainly want that. Citizens living in the UK, UK citizens living elsewhere in the 27. We're well aware of how crucially problematic this is for the Republic and the North of Ireland. No two ways about that. And I think it's a real shame that Westminster is not hearing a wider range of voices in its chamber there. But I think, too, that when we're looking at what can we try and make sure is in the agenda, again, we've been hearing a lot about what people are trying to get into the withdrawal bill in terms of certainties, in terms of crucial issues about um, whether that's the, the you know, polluter pays principle, precautionary principles, all of these things which I think you know, the UK, yes, should be demanding from the withdrawal bill. The European Parliament, we need to be doing more of that, I think, as well, about what we want to see our governments standing up for there. But in many respects, that is our plan B, to get the best possible withdrawal bill. Because I think we are clear that the resistance is still on. And I do take the point very, very seriously that was made about the constitutional crisis that I believe the UK is facing at the moment as well. And that has really been shown up by the whole Brexit situation, let alone the lack of clear rules about what constitutes a formal referendum, thresholds, etc. All of these issues that we're now confronting when we're looking at whether it's Catalonia, whether it's Kurdistan, whatever else, that we're looking to at who is it who has the right to push that referendum. I think we have a major problem about English identity within this, which has been growing for a very long time, and where, in a sense, England has always assumed that the national parliament was England. You know, we don't need an English parliament because, hey, we have Westminster. That, so therefore, I think a lot about what we think about in terms of English identity, what are our symbols which haven't been captured by the far right, what are the great industries that we now might be looking for, all of these sorts of things that gives people a sense of purpose and identity need to be dealt with whether we're in or out of the European Union. But certainly the questions that have arisen about devolved powers and how certain are the powers of the devolved institutions when they can be taken away at the snap of fingers, the Henry VIII powers, the role of Parliament itself. You know, the Article 50 bill, you were hearing some people saying, oh, it's, no, but it's really good. We've won a concession from the government. We get a vote on this. You're thinking, what the... Yeah, you know, um, a concession? You're the Parliament. It's not a concession. It's your right. You know, it's the right of Parliament the right of Parliament to have a meaningful vote, the right of Parliament to see the information, the right of Parliament to be able to hold this government to account. And I think that, you know, when it's taken flipping court cases to remind the government that Parliament has a role, I think that there are some huge questions to be asked about the quality of our governance. So if we're going to be staying in the European Union, we might like to add ourselves to Poland and Hungary in terms of looking at our democratic institutions. <laughs> And frankly, too, that if certain of the things that are put forward for the withdrawal bill don't get put in there, about the questions of human rights, and this is one that's been raised in the Parliament about the European Parliament, the question of the human rights architecture in Ireland, north and south, where this fits with the peace process, whether in fact our own Equality and Human Rights Commission is going to be able to remain a member of the wider network at the European level. All of those questions about the risks to human rights, to environment policy, to some of the very, very things which we hold dear and essential and which we know under attack, are under attack need to be defended and fought for. Because whether we're in or out, these are important. And for the next European elections, and of course, 
the UK may well not be um, participating in those um, at all. Although you may well be pleased to hear that UKIP are saying that if there's a transitional period, they believe that UK MEPs should be allowed to stay on during that transitional period to make sure that, um, that Brexit really happens. So, you know, they're looking um, at their interests. They have been working with parties across the European Union. I've said to my colleagues in Brussels, have a look at Nigel Farage's um, travel engagements and whichever country he's going to next, be very afraid and get in there and do some work. Because these are movements, as we know, which see those who argue for strong measures to combat climate change, but those who consider themselves defenders of the environment, who promote feminism, who promote multicultural communities, are the enemy. That's what we're currently facing. So I think we do need to be working on a strong pushback on that. If we're not actually standing for election in the European Parliament ourselves as a party next time round, let us know what we can do to support others, because the Green Group is going to be very much needed in that next European Parliament. And at the moment, of course, we provide six members because we also have the Scots Nats and Plaid with us. The one good thing is that the Conservative and Reformists will be a lot weaker because the Tories won't be there. S&D will be weaker because Labour won't be there. The EPP, the largest centre-right group, will have no change. So when we're looking at the balance of the forces in that next Parliament, we need to do what we can to make sure that the Greens are there, that they're stronger, that we are organising across borders against this threat, which actually is not just a threat to our political movement. It does, if it works, actually constitute a threat, I believe, to the future of the planet. So that Brexit has thrown up many things that we could, should be doing better. It also throws up, I think, a real threat to the political direction um, you know, that where we may be going on in future. But as others have been saying today, I don't think we accept it. I think we fight back, that we actually say to the public, as I've said before, I'm a member of the European Parliament. I get a vote on this deal. I would really like you as members of the British public to have a vote on it as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean, for those thoughtful uh, remarks and European remarks. Uh, thank you, Nula, for chairing the final panel. Thank you to all the speakers, and thank you to all of you for uh, giving up a precious Saturday to uh, engage in the cause. And um, thank you, Ray, for convening this whole series yeah. across Europe. <laughs>